All right, everybody, it is Thursday, December 3rd, 2020, and this is the Five Business Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Auger, and today we're going to be covering a bunch of topics. I know it's been a while since I've done this style of Five Business Podcast, so we've got a lot to catch up on. We've got Clarissa Shields signing with the PFL. That's massive news. We've got Habib buying GFC, renaming it to EFC, and, and that now being on Fight Pass. What that means for both Habib, the UFC, a possible Habib return, Tyson's versus Jones, obviously happened not too long ago. We've got to talk about the pay-per-view buys there, uh, how that event went down, what it meant for the business. Triller moving into a boxing league, the guys that put on Tyson versus Jones, uh, they are now moving into a boxing league hosted by Snoop Dogg. That's a whole interesting idea. We'll discuss the business ramifications of that, how promotions like that in the past have done, and what they can possibly do to keep the longevity going there. And then we'll give some updates on the UFC antitrust lawsuit, as well as the PFL lawsuit, especially with Clarissa Shield signing. That's there's, there's some good updates there. So uh, before we go any further, please like and subscribe. We're trying to get to 1000 subscribers by the end of the year. I know it's a high goal, but I really feel like we put out good content, different content would love for you to like and subscribe if you're watching this and you haven't already and really appreciate it. And always again, feel free to drop questions in the comments and uh hit me up on twitter at all day oj spelled a-u-g-e-r love answering this type of stuff love answering questions about business side of mma so feel feel free to hit me up With that in mind let's go ahead and dive right into it so clarissa shields has signed with the pfl this is an interesting move for a couple of reasons if you'll remember back at ufc 245 clarissa shields showed up i was there i was covering the event and at the time we didn't expect her to you know come to the back and do interviews but when she did she mentioned oh yeah maybe i want to fight amanda nunez oh maybe i can go ahead and train you know my ground game B bjj wrestling all of that you know I, I should be able to train that up a bit and get to a point where it, it matches my striking that was the narrative she was selling at the time at a UFC event. I think that part is massive because she didn't sign with the UFC. She went ahead and signed with PFL. Uh, and we'll dive into that a little bit, but just the fact that Shields has now actually taken that step into MMA, it doesn't surprise me a whole lot, especially when you look at fighter pay for women in boxing. It's, it's kind of this weird inverse relationship between MMA and boxing where male fighters in MMA always want to go over to boxing because you're going to get those massive paydays if you're at the top, right? If you're a champion and you're fighting, you know, if you're Andy Ruiz and you upset Anthony Joshua and then you turn around and you do the rematch, even though he lost, that payday's huge, right? I mean, $7 million, I think, something like that. Way more than you're ever going to get guaranteed in the UFC unless you're a Conor McGregor or a Ronda Rousey. Otherwise, you know, you're talking... A, a small sliver of that type of money. So male fighters almost always want to go into boxing. The inverse is true of female fighters. Clarissa brought that up at the UFC 245 uh, press conference she did in the back with, with the media there, is that, you know, female boxers don't get paid. She's been a dominant, dominant champion in boxing. She, she has looked phenomenal. She's pretty much run through anyone they've put at her. And yet she wants to go into MMA because the, the pay is better. Part of the reason she was talking about fighting Nunez doing all that is because if she fought Nunez for the title, she's making more money than she fight than she does as champion in boxing. So, you know, that, that's part of Holly Holm, right? That's another example. Went from that boxing, kickboxing world to MMA because she could get paid more. And, and that's something that, I feel like people have kind of missed, fans have kind of missed um, in terms of a huge reason why she's making this move. You know, um, I know there's the narratives out there, she's looking to challenge herself, do all that. Yeah, but but really at its core, it's a financial decision. And it's something that she alluded to a while ago. That's why it's not that surprising to me she actually made the move. Because even if she goes out there, she gets taken down, she gets submitted, and it's just, you know, that's a wrap. She's going to get paid a lot of money to do that. More money than she probably makes defending her, her titles in the ring in boxing. And, you know, at least if you're getting taken down and submitted like that, it's probably going to be quick too, right? You know, you're not going to get in these long boxing matches. Uh, it, that That's not going to happen. 
in the UFC. If if she ends up, you know, facing that opposition, it's going to be quick. And and if she keeps it on the feet and strikes, right? I think then she she easily gets wins. And I would imagine I would imagine the PFL is going to feed her at least at the beginning, right? Because this is a massive signing for them. They're going to be feeding her stand up stand up fighters. I would not expect you to see Clarissa Shields versus uh, Kayla Harrison or anyone that even has a hint of a ground game facing Clarissa Shields anytime soon. You know, she said she's been she's doing work on, you know, uh, her her wrestling and her BJJ, but we all know what that can look like, right? I mean, let's not forget others that have tried to make this leap from boxing to uh, MMA. It, it just, you know, a couple of years isn't going to cut it, especially when you get to the higher level that many of these mixed martial artists are already at in especially the league like PFL. A lot of people like to, you know, get down on the PFL like, yeah, it's got talent, but it's not like UFC caliber talent, right? That's that's really part of the narrative is there will always be gems of talent everywhere you go in every promotion. And even if the UFC overall, yes, has a much better talent pool than the PFL, that statement is true at this moment. Outside of, of the PFL's big stars, right? You know, a lot of these other, we and we've seen in a, a former PFL guys going to the UFC, we've seen mixed results. Uh, Daniel Pineda, who's fighting Cub Swanson, right? Went out there, looked phenomenal. Uh, Felipe Linz, former PFL champion, goes over, uh, not looking so hot. Uh, and that happens. But regardless, these are still, just to get into any type of league <laughs> at that level, you have to be very good at MMA. And you have to at least have some semblance of either takedown defense, a ground game, something. And so it, it's one of those things where Clarissa Shields will be one of the top strikers already going in to the PFL, especially with her, her boxing. Yes, I, I think, you know, she's got real potential on the feet. And, and we'll see how that translates when you add in kicks, things like that. But I think she's got enormous potential on the feet. But on the ground... Uh, you know, we'll see. Unless she's a, a protege or she's been at this much longer than she's let on, I don't expect her to do well in, in that world. And I would imagine the PFL is going to protect their newly signed asset at least for a year or two. She'll eventually get to a point where they'll have to throw, you know, uh, certain people at her. I would imagine at some point, maybe you build up to a level of, uh, Kayla Harrison versus Clarissa Shields, if it makes sense to do so. I think Kayla wins that fight, you know, 19 out of 20 times. <laughs> um, maybe more, probably more at this point, to be honest. But maybe they go that route, but you are not going to see her in there um, against any ground people right off the bat because it's bad for business. That's just straight up bad for business. Now, Again, why did she sign with the PFL over the UFC when she made the announcement that she was looking to get into MMA at the UFC? I mean, the UFC consistently, you know, pays fighters lower than other promotions, uh, especially fighters the caliber of Clarissa Shields. And here's what I mean by that. If you look at, let's say, Rory McDonald, right? Left the UFC around the top five rankings, I believe. I think he was four or five, he had lost a, a decision to Wonderboy Thompson fighting out his contract, bet on himself, talked about that, lost, right? And then went over to Bellator. Openly said he's making more money in Bellator. Bellator tried to keep him, made an effort, a good faith effort to keep him. He went to the PFL, I would imagine, because again, he's getting more money. And, and I mean, if you're in a million dollar tournament, right? talk about real money there. So looking at all this, it, it's one of those things where when you are at a level where you have legitimate skills, but you're not quite the best of the best in the UFC's eyes, that is, that's when you, you find yourself wanting to look at Bellator, PFL, one, one championship, all of those promotions that are going to pay you more because in those leagues, there's a very good shot you could be the best of the best or you've at least got enough name value that you could elevate that promotion, 
right? A Rory McDonald is great to have on the UFC roster, but in the, you know, that that's a, a, a scenario of how many Rory McDonald's does the UFC have, right? Uh, compared to other promotions. You go to Bellator, you go to PFL, then you're the big fish in the small pond. And, and that's really what a fighter like Clarissa Shields can get from the PFL. She can get a much higher base pay. She can get an opportunity probably eventually at the million dollar prize. We'll see on that. Maybe they'll just have her again do exhibitions and kind of protect her from having to go face to face with with some, you know, girls with some really legit ground games. But either way, you know, she elevates the PFL brand. She goes to the UFC. Oh, that's a big sign. That's cool. But it's not going to have that same wow factor. It's not going to elevate the UFC brand that much. And, and that's really the business side of it is when you see guys like Gegard Mousasi and Roy McDonald and uh, in this case, Clarissa Shields moving from boxing to MMA, F- Fabricio Verdum, another perfect example, going to the PFL. Those guys, their name value is enough to elevate other brands like PFL, Bellator and One, but not the UFC, at least not to the same level. And that's where it makes more financial sense for them to go to those other promotions. I think it's a smart move by Clarissa. I think the PFL will treat her like a star, which she will love. I think they will protect her in a proper fashion. Um, I would assume that they're going to have her again. Only really fight, you know, stand up fighters for a while, probably check in on her ground game, see, you know, how good is she going, talk with coaches, things like that. Really groom her to to try and be successful in MMA because they don't want a scenario that we've seen with some other uh, boxers in the past moving to MMA. They do not want a scenario where it's like, hey, it's this big signing. She comes over, she gets submitted her first time out. And then she gets admitted again the second time out. It's like, well, why did you sign her, right? That just hurts the PFL. That just hurts Shields' brand. And they don't want to do that. So I, I think it's a smart move. Um, we'll, we'll see if she's going to end up being in the 2021 tournament. I, I would highly doubt it. I'm pretty sure they'll keep her in exhibition matches for a while. Um, you know, it, it's... We'll, we'll see how that goes. I know she is high enough on her own abilities and that she was very confident at UFC 245 talking about she thought she only needed, you know, six months to two years or something to learn the ground game aspect. That's, you know, that's some um, uh, optimistic, <laughs> uh, optimistic thinking right there. And who knows? Maybe she ends up being enough of a prodigy on the ground to at least stuff takedowns to at least you know know how to get out of tricky situations that she's good because if she can just get back to her feet consistently right if she's not fighting off her back a lot like look at max holloway that's a perfect example that dude gets taken down and then gets right back up it's so hard to keep him down if you watch any one of his fights where people are going for takedowns, it's just nearly impossible to keep Max Holloway on the ground. He always finds a way to stand up. If Clarissa has that ability, she doesn't need to worry as much about, you know, blocking certain submission techniques and, you know, worrying about fighting off of her back and things like that. She still should learn that, you know, <laughs> should still learn that aspect, but it's not going to be the same necessity. If she's able to stuff the takedowns, is able to get up to her feet quickly and has that type of natural ability, then I see a path of her being quite possibly a big star very quickly in the MMA world, especially with her background in boxing. But whether or not she has those skills, whether or not she can develop them in that short of a time frame is a whole nother you know, issue. And it's clear that from the PFL's perspective, right? She's going to have to fight those people eventually. You can't guard her forever. And by her announcing that she's signed with PFL, by that that being out in the world now, this isn't something where you've negotiated some deal. Nobody really knows about it. You're giving your fighter time. Once you've, once you've announced it to the world, you have a set time limit to get her in to face real competition. And that clock has officially started. So we'll see how they handle it. Um, Understand why she went with PFL over organization like the UFC or Bellator. Think it's the right move. Um, we'll, we'll see. I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm glad PFL got that name 
it's going to be a big challenge for her. I think either way, worst case scenario for both the promotion and her is that she gets knocked out in a stand-up war. I mean, we are going down to four ounce gloves. Um, so, so who knows, but I, I don't really see that happening. I think she'll be groomed. Well, I think she'll get some knockouts. She'll get some time to work on her ground game and then she'll get tested and we'll see where, see where it goes, but it's, it's a big move by the PFL and great business in my opinion. All right, next up, we got to talk about Habib Nurmagomedov purchasing Gorilla Fighting Championships. Big deal. Uh, a lot of people didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming, although it does make sense. Uh, I've previously done an article that's on the Body Lock about his involvement with MMA Global, which is a, a new type of promotion that's trying to break out in the U.S., have studio-type shows you can invest in it, Right. That's that's their big pitch right now is that the fans can own part of it. Um, he said he's going to help train people. He's going to be a part of it. His exact role is still unknown. He's going to be a global ambassador. He's obviously made videos about it. He, he's on the company website for MMA Global. That all makes sense from a business perspective of, hey, you've got a big star promoting your product. What his actual day to day role in there is unknown. With GFC, which he's now renaming to Eagle Fighting Championship, that's a different ball game. That's he's becoming a promoter now. He's he's essentially doing what Dana White does in in promoting and running an organization. And given his background and and the interviews he's done about it, there's some very interesting parts here. You know, he had a hard time getting into the UFC. A lot of Russian fighters have a hard time getting into the UFC. There are situations that are known about in the business um, where you've got certain Russian coaches trying to, you know, call up uh, places like SureDog and Tapology. When I worked at SureDog, he had certain <laughs> promoters and certain coaches emailing me saying like, hey, you need to add these fights with no record of the fight actually taking place. That happens. They essentially try and pad their their fighters' records, especially in in the you know Russian area of of trying to pad their fighters' records to be ten and 0, 11 and zero, so that then they can get the attention of an organization like the UFC and get signed there. They will attempt. They have attempted with me to say like, "Hey, this fight exists," and when I've gone and done research, it turns out no. Or, or it turns out, yes, that event happened, but they didn't fight on it. There's a recording of the event. Your guy's not there. Yet you've emailed me and told me, oh, no, he fought there. He won. He got knockout. And, and they do that. That's a thing. A lot of people don't know about that. A lot of people don't talk about it. It's really trying to pad their fighter's record so that they can get into the UFC. That is a thing I have experienced firsthand. You can ask the other guys at SureDog. I'm sure Tapology deals with it the same way. It, it's definitely a thing that goes on. And I think Habib views this as an opportunity in purchasing uh, well, what is now EFC to kind of set up a channel for fighters on that side of the world to have a set route into the UFC. We saw it with M1 Global, right? Kind of reaching that partnership with the UFC to kind of set up feeder leagues and things like that. This seems like another iteration of that, of Habib's going to run a promotion. It's going to be on Fight Pass. That, that deal is already set, uh, and they're going to work together to find fighters in that region of the world that make sense uh, to sign and, and move to the UFC and kind of, you know, become that, I don't want to say, I mean, regional. Yes, I would say regional because it covers one particular region of the world. So that regional feeder league for the UFC, because right now that really doesn't exist. You have M1 Global. That's the only one that's kind of there. Um, but th this would be a, another version of that that I imagine would get more traction and would be bigger, especially with Habib at the helm, right? I mean, his name alone is going to get more eyes on EFC than probably M1 has seen in quite some time. So I understand from a business perspective why he's, he's going for that. It's also not going to compete with MMA Global MMA Global is going to do the U.S. market. EFC is really looking for the Middle East, uh, Russia, that that side of the world, and trying to keep it 
in just that region. So it's it's a smart business move for Habib all the way around. Uh, another aspect of this is from the UFC's perspective, from Dana's perspective, it makes all the sense in the world to get a deal done with EFC and to keep Habib close. Reason being, you know, it, it's very clear that Dana White and the UFC want Habib to come back and continue to fight. His last, I was asked this uh, a while back. I'm not sure if I answered the comment before, so if I did not, I apologize. Answering now, I'll, I'll go back and check after this recording. Um, was I was asked, you know, how, how big was Habib's essentially retirement fight against Justin Gagey? How big was that in Russia? And we didn't have numbers immediately at the time. You know, it's it's come out now on the free Russia TV service, which is part of a deal with UFC Russia, which the UFC has in place that again, I imagine they're probably renegotiating again based on these numbers. Uh, that fight against Justin Gagey was in 11 million, 11 million viewers. That's massive. That's huge. And that's part of the reason I've, I've mentioned it in other places. That's part of the reason I think you're seeing this new interest in fighters from uh, Dagestan, Russia, or, or that have those backgrounds. Hamzat Shemaev is a perfect example. If you look at the videos on him, yes, he he has been a monster in the cage. No doubt about it. He's fought at two different weight classes, turned around, done it in a short time span. Yes, that's all well and good. But it's one of those things where he doesn't have that McGregor personality that pops out that you're like, oh, he's just drawing everybody in. He kind of has it. His trash talk is the worst, but... It's not that same level. So when you look at then the social media metrics and the, the YouTube views, you know, if anybody, go look at any site right now, they they have Hamza Chamayev content somewhere. Or it might be, I don't know, it would be clickbaity. That's not the right word necessarily. But they're highlighting that and highlighting Hamza Chamayev wherever they can because the views are, are just racking up. Why? I think a huge part of it is, yes, what he's done in the cage, yes, that little, that personality, sure, but I think a massive part of it is Habib's success. I think Habib has really broken through to the point now where were he to fight again on a regular pay-per-view, um, you know, prime time, because remember, this last fight was was prime, prime time in Russia, which I think was a massive business move by the UFC. I've mentioned that before because they wanted to get more Russian eyes uh, on Habib and on the promotion. But I think if they went back to the US now and they kind of did a, you know, Saturday night, uh, Ted and Eastern main card, Habib versus, I don't know, let's say Tony, right? McGregor's a whole outlier because then you've got the competing star power and all of that. I'm sure, I'm sure at this point it would probably do well, I don't know if it would do as well as Habib versus McGregor 2 just because, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> Habib versus McGregor 1, just because that, you know, question mark of who's going to come out better, I think a lot of people would still favor Habib there. But if McGregor beats Poirier, continues to go all, all out on all that, that's a different story. But that's that's neither here nor there. I think if he just fights anybody of note and headlines a pay-per-view, Habib now pulls in much bigger numbers than he has before. I think... This especially really broke him through in the Russian market, especially based on those metrics. And I think Hamzat is seeing a benefit of that. I think other Dagestani and Russian fighters will see a benefit of that as they continue to climb up the ranks. We'll see for sure. Um, but I, I definitely think that Habib is at the height of his stardom. And I think it's hard to dispute that given the way he dismantled Justin Gaethje and everything he's done as of late. There's no more questions about, oh, well, you know, what about his competition? Yeah, he beat McGregor, but I mean, otherwise, well, you know, I, I'll clean up. I think a lot of those questions are gone. And I think he's done it in such an impressive fashion that he's really reached a new level of stardom. And I had mentioned it before on, on a separate episode that, that sucks for the UFC that he decided to retire pull the GSP. That was always something they were worried about happening going into that fight. Uh, I don't think they expected him to do it on that fight. They probably thought he had at least one more in him. But they were, you know, 
always kind of worried he would end up retiring and they always had to look out for it. And lo and behold, that's what happened. So uh, at this point, getting Habib involved in the UFC at all, even if it's through a new regional promotion where he's the owner, he's the head, I think that still helps the UFC overall. It still allows them to capitalize on Habib, albeit in a different way and not as lucrative for them as they probably like. But it it still is, hey, like, look, here is our superstar, undefeated, lightweight champion of the world. And yes, now he's gone out and run his own promotion. That's awesome. And you you can tie that in so many different ways through marketing, through through partnerships, cross-promotion, all of that. And I think it also allows Dana to, you know, slowly but surely push that idea of, hey, maybe you come back, right? Yeah, maybe you do 30. Habib's pretty much said that unless his mother changes his mind, because that's why he said he promised his mom uh, that that was going to be his last fight. He said, unless his mother changes his mind or changes her mind, uh, you know, that's not going to be a thing. He's not coming back. I believe him there. I really do. I think that if his mother is adamant about him not fighting anymore, I don't think he will. He's far too, uh, you know, he, he's far too concerned about legacy and family, which I respect. I, I really do, especially in the age of, of, you know, let's get, you know, double champs and money fights. You know, we're kind of coming out of that money fight era. It's still here, but it, we're at the tail end of it, I believe. Um, you know, it's nice to see someone that's really about legacy, really honors certain things. I, I respect that decision. But if she were to change his, her mind or if Dana was to convince her, you know, that's not that far fetched, especially if they're willing to pay him a lot of money. He said in the interview, you need a hundred million dollars. Uh, that's unlikely. But, uh, but I mean, they may offer him a lot of money and, Again, he's about to buy, a, oh, well, sorry, he did buy a promotion. And he even said in his most recent interview about it, the goal right now with EFC is not to make money, it's just to not lose money, just to kind of break even. And eventually you'll get to the making money part, which makes sense. But right now it's, you know, let's not lose money. But the danger there is that let's say EFC doesn't take off. Let's say it has financial issues. Let's say he's forced to put more of his own money into the promotion, there's always a risk that a couple years down the road, suddenly he doesn't have as much money as he planned for. And now the UFC is still there knocking, saying, hey, dude, we'll pay you a a crazy high base. We'll give you great pay-per-view points. Just come on back. And then maybe it's harder to say no. Right now, it's easy for him to say no. Couple years running a business, especially if things don't go well, I mean... How many times have we seen elite athletes in any sport essentially try and come back either past their prime or after they've retired and they didn't want to come back, they come back because of financial reasons. It happens all the time. And I hope that doesn't happen to Abib. I hope if he comes back, it's for the right reasons. It's either a legacy fight or he's really getting paid and it's not something where he needs the money, you know, and his mom signed off on it, all of that. And because I'd love to see him fight again, I think everybody would. But it's one of those things where going into business with Habib keeps him at an arm's length for the UFC. And that is very important, especially while they're still trying to get him to fight. So I would imagine a lot of promotion from the UFC on this one, a lot of cross promotion. They're going to be talking about this every single fight, like new on fight pass, EFC run by Habib. Off. You know, expect a barrage of marketing talking about how great this is. Expect, you know, Dane to say, yeah, we're talking about it. We're seeing blah, blah, blah. Expect a lot of, you know, rumors and things like that to keep being churned out about Habib returning and all of that. I think that's all inevitable. But at the same time, from Habib's point of view, this is a great business move. This gives him, you know, a way to stay in the sport without actually needing to compete between MMA Global and now EFC. I I hope it does well. I would love to see some of the ideas they're tossing around. Um, You know, they're they're talking about having champions kind of still be managed and and have certain contracts from EFC going into the UFC. 
I need to dive into that a little bit more because it's obviously translated from uh, Russian. So need to understand exactly what that's about. But I believe if I understand the concept correctly, that would be interesting because it would kind of give uh, EFC fighters an ability to have more uh, options than most UFC fighters, I would say, under contract in terms of where you can fight, who you can fight, things of that nature. Um, you know, it, it should be interesting. I hope it turns into a good promotion. I hope, you know, the guys that are signed from EFC do well in the UFC because if they don't, then that that kind of reputation can hurt the brand. Um, but it should be should be a fun new chapter for Habib and, and we'll definitely keep an eye on it, but expect a ton of marketing about it from the UFC. If, if you don't hear... <laughs> Uh, I don't know about this fight night. I definitely think probably by UFC 256, if not for sure next year, um, early next year. If you don't hear and see anything and everything about EFC now being a part of UFC Fight Pass, uh, then uh, I don't even know. I, I can't imagine I'm wrong on that. So expect to hear all about it for the next year or so, minimum. All right, next thing we need to talk about is the return of Iron Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. I mean, this was an event. This was something else. Um, we have another video. I, I highly encourage you to check out on uh, the Body Lock YouTube page uh, that covers this with uh, Matthew Wells and Ant Walker discussing this a little bit more. But, you know, this was an interesting event and it was an interesting business ploy. If you watch the Fight Business Podcast, you know I've had John Nutt, you know, the, the ring master himself of Fight Circus on the show multiple times. He's over here on the MMA spectrum, right? If he's normal, he's way over here. Jones versus Tyson was somewhere in the middle, somewhere around here. It, it wasn't quite legitimate sport in the sense of, one, you knew... A lot of people were up in arms about the draw, but if you paid attention, it was always going to be a draw. Uh, you had special rounds. Uh, uh, you know, rounds were shorter than normal. Uh, you had some kind of vague things put out there about no KOs or going for the KOs. It's a sparring match, right? It's an exhibition. It wasn't Tyson versus Jones. These guys are fighting for a real belt. These guys are trying to take each other heads off. Uh, you know, we're going to the judges' scorecard. This is a real important fight. No, it was it was something else. It was much more of a, a entertainment spectacle than a real fight. And it was what you would expect from you know two guys that are that age to get in there and and fight. They looked not terrible. It wasn't like oh you know this is bad. It was yeah they're gassing pretty hard. They're older. This is you know um, it made sense. And then you had in you know. He had in between every fight, and we'll get to the co-main in a minute because that's a whole other business proposition. Uh, but, you know, in between fights, you had musical acts, right? And not just like one song. You had Wiz Khalifa do like several. You had French parts. You had everybody do a set. It was essentially concert uh, in between each fight. And then you had, you know, Mauro Renault on commentary. You had Sugar Ray Robinson. You had Snoop Dogg coming back. Um, I mean, it, it was an entertainment event. That's what this was meant to be. And it was $50 for the pay-per-view. And the reports coming out are that it sold 1.2 million pay-per-view buys. That's very successful, especially for an event like this. Um, you know, you had Jake Paul versus Nate Robinson. So a YouTuber versus a former New York Knicks <laughs> superstar uh, competed in a boxing match as the co-main. And, you know, it, it's one of those things. That's probably, that fight is probably the highlight of, of Nate Robinson getting laid out by Jake Paul. Probably the highlight of the actual boxing matches. Um, but, I mean, th this is an entertainment idea that's in the realm of combat sports, but not legitimate ranked fighting, if that makes sense. <sighs> It worked very well. It worked extremely well for what it was. Mike Tyson's talking about a Legends League. He wants to fight every couple of months. The longevity of that is hard to say. Um, 
and and this ties into you know very recently Triller announced that it's doing a, a sponsorship with Snoop Dogg where they're going to offer celebrities and YouTube stars and things like that to if they want to do amateur fights, boxing, whatever, you can come on this you know this show. It's a boxing league called the Fight Fight Club um, to to basically put on these kind of hesitate to say freak show fights, but kind of freak show fights. And this isn't anything new in the boxing or MMA world for that matter, but in the combat sports world in general. A lot of people are saying, oh, this is the death of boxing. How can you do this? This blah, blah, blah. That's ludicrous. That's This stuff has always been around. Celebrity boxing matches have always been around. I, I would like to point out as someone mentioned the other day on Twitter, I think it was Jedi Goodman. China, the old WWF wrestler, intercontinental champion, all that part of Degeneration X, China, you you know her, China, uh, fought Butafuko in boxing. And it was high, it got higher ratings than any UFC card on Fox. That was on Fox, that... Uh, China versus Butafuco card was on Fox and it got higher ratings than any UFC card throughout the tenure of the UFC's, you know, broadcast rights deal with Fox. It, it got higher ratings than any of those cards. Freak show fights will always have a draw. I've, I've mentioned this before. I'll continue to shout this from the rooftops. Freak show fights will always pull people in, especially with celebrities that have enough of a following in their own right that those they, they won't convert into hardcore fans necessarily. Maybe you get a small portion of them to convert into hardcore fans or to, to get into the sport. Most won't convert though and will just follow the celebrity to no matter you know no matter where they go. AKA Jake Paul, Logan Paul, right? Those guys, those brothers make stupid money doing ridiculous things. They've done Ugh, terrible things, which is a whole nother uh, topic. But, you know, their fans just follow them around. No matter what they do, they're going to go watch them. Most of them aren't going to be like, man, I saw Jake Paul box and man, now I just really love boxing. No, you're not going to convert most of those fans. Those are casuals through and through that are following a, a celebrity that happens to intersect with your sport. That's always going to happen with these celebrity fights. And if you get the right celebrities, you can keep up the draws, right? If you told me tomorrow that Snoop Dogg was going to go in there and fight, I don't know, Nas, or, or Nas was going to fight Jay-Z, right? Uh, <laughs> chances are I'm going to turn it on and say, really? Okay, cool. Let's, you know, let's check this out. Um, but if you if you expect this to be a long lasting thing, no matter what name you put in there, that that's not going to work. From a business perspective, the longevity of this depends solely on who you can book and how you can book it out enough that you keep those A or B, maybe C list celebrities. But generally, you want A and B list celebrities constantly headlining cards and, and matchups that really draw people in. Because in and of itself, as a celebrity boxing match is a spectacle. And the second time, for example, the next time Tyson fights, it's not going to do as well. I can't imagine it does 1.2 million pay-per-view buys. Even if it is the Holyfield trilogy. If it's the Holyfield trilogy, holy crap, that's, you know... Whoa, that's a big deal. But even if that happens, I don't think it does as well because it's not, oh man, there's Mike Tyson coming out of retirement. How does he look? What is this? You know, especially it, it'd be different if Tyson went in there and just like in a, in a real fight with Roy Jones Jr. just took his head off, right? What made it just looked amazing, knocked him out clean. It was like, wow, return to Mike Tyson. That'd be different. But if it's another exhibition type thing that's kind of sparring, like, yes, there will be interest. Yes, people will watch, but you're going to lose a, a big chunk of the audience moving forward because it's just not, you know, the same questions 
aren't being answered. It's not how does Mike Tyson look after 15 years off, you know, or how did you know how is Roy Jones going to look against Mike Tyson, two of of the greatest boxers in their prime, going head to head. Though those questions were mostly answered, and so now even if you do Holyfield, it's like okay, well, how does Holyfield look? Yeah, and how does Tyson look? Well, probably look similar to what he did Jones. You have a, a new you know, point of reference to go off of, it doesn't have the same appeal. And yes, you could do Jake Paul versus another NBA person or a YouTuber or whoever, but even that will lose some of its steam just because it's now become something people are accustomed with. There aren't all of these questions. That's that's a huge thing about combat sports and business when you're doing freak show fights is the more questions you have going into any fight, in combat sports is a good thing, right? Man, Gaethje's looked amazing, and he's got a D1 wrestling background. He's, he might arguably the, be the best wrestler that Habib's fought, and he's just been on a tear. Like, can Habib keep him down? Can Gaethje get off of his back? There were so many questions there, big questions, that that draws you in. McGregor versus Habib, even more questions. Like, here's this dude that's just, you know, been knocking pretty much everybody out. And then you've got, you know, Habib who has, is undefeated, has, you know, won the belt, but not necessarily against legitimate competition at the time. I mean, Alar Quint is good, but you know, that, that whole thing was a mess. You've got all that going on. It's a lot of questions, a lot of questions that it, you know, get answered there and really draw people in. There's there's so much curiosity there. In a situation where, let's say you did Jones versus uh, Tyson 2, right? Let's say you went ahead and did that. Do you think that does even half of the buys? Even if it's a year from now and Jones is like, yeah, man, really want to make sure now we put a stamp on this, blah, blah, blah. Or let's say that they say, you know what? It, it's a normal sanctioned boxing match. Let's go ahead, put judges on there. Let's make it, you know, the whole shebang. You tell me, is your interest still there? Probably a little bit, but not nearly as much as it was. And that's the hardest thing about freak show fights. So 1.2 million buys is still amazing for Tyson Jones. It's a great draw and a great, uh, a great gate for, and, and well, sorry, not gate, a great, a great pull for Triller, who's trying to get their name out there. Definitely has gotten their name out there. It's great marketing, all of that. I mean, it, it it is about as successful as you could have hoped for. But how that will translate into the Fight Club Boxing League that's going to be run with Snoop Dogg, I don't know. It's really going to be dependent on pulling in the right celebrities at the right times to fight and getting the marketing around it in such a way that, you know, people start to want to tune in to just see which celebrities are going to fight. Because I guarantee if you have, I think they're aiming for five day shows a year, guarantee if you have six straight shows of crazy celebrity fights that, you know, just crush it. Let's say there are a million, two million pay-per-views easy every time. And then on the seventh fight, you get a C-lister versus maybe a low B-list celebrity or somebody, you know, two stars that just don't have, have a following but don't have the same pull. I guarantee you those buys are going to tank because it's very, very hard to build a brand around celebrity fights. And it's even harder to get that brand to stick in the minds of someone where they become a fan of the brand past their celebrity infatuation, right? You're not, I, I can't imagine if Snoop Dogg gets in there and fights somebody, I can't imagine as a, a adamant diehard Snoop Dogg fan, if I never really watched boxing before, I'm going to watch a Snoop Dogg boxing fight and be like, man, you know what? I want to see more celebrities go at this like this, man. I like, Now I'm into boxing. I, ah, it's so hard. If there's some already kind of semi-interest there, yeah, you might be able to convert some people or maybe they haven't really thought about watching combat sports and now they see it and they're like, wow, this is really cool. Yes, that will happen. But for the most part, it's not going to be something that, that translates super well in the conversion and something that is 
easily sustainable. It's going to be a lot. It would take years and years of booking just the right fights in order to get that brand to a point where people are watching that brand regularly, regardless of what celebrity is fighting or, you know, amateur fighter or what have you. So I think the idea of Jones versus Tyson was was great. I think it's a great one off. I think maybe if, if you do it annually, it's possible. But we've seen this in the past with, you know, celebrity boxing matches with freak show fights trying to be a regular thing. It, it's not an easy, easy thing to sustain. And I honestly don't see it being sustained here. I, I think you've probably got a year, maybe two at max. And then it's, you know, popularity is going to wane. And it, unless you get the right people, unless Triller is that connected, I, I think you're probably looking at a new and exciting, you know, fad that may, at, at best, a new and exciting fad that pops up for a couple of years and then dies out. Or at worst, you're looking at, you know, a year where it just doesn't bring in the ratings, uh, doesn't doesn't bring in the money that it's it's open to and it's a loss. I would imagine you're closer to the worst scenario than you are to the best. That's my personal opinion. But definitely curious to hear your thoughts on it. So make sure you you drop a comment on what your thoughts are regarding that new fight club uh, with Triller. Last thing I want to touch on here pretty quickly is updates to the UFC antitrust lawsuit and the PFL lawsuit. So um, PFL, we'll just gloss over that real quickly. You'll, you'll have noticed that any talk on social media, at least, of the PFL lawsuit has kind of gone away. You saw Kayla Harrison compete in Invicta. You, you She's looking to compete in Titan FC. You've heard about the Clarissa Shield signing, obviously, as we've just covered. Um, but the lawsuit talks kind of died down. I think the PFL called the fighters bluff, and they won, to be honest. At this point, it's not set in stone, but season, you know, 2021 season is coming up in April, I believe is when they're talking about starting to do some things. You're not hearing rumblings from the fighters. You're not seeing any documentation coming out. There were threats a while ago, but I, I'm not seeing any indication at this point fighters are going to actually file suit and are going to follow through with it. Um, if they were, I think by now you would have seen some legal document that kind of hints like, hey, lawsuit's coming, something. And and literally it's just been crickets from both sides on, on any legal disputes regarding what's going on. It's possible they're, they're trying to work it out um, behind closed doors. And then, you know, two weeks from now, all of a sudden, hey, something's happened. That's, that is possible still. But the way I'm reading the landscape right now and as other combat sports lawyers, uh, have mentioned it really seems like the fighters were trying to pressure the PFL to give them some more leeway and that has not really worked I mean they've said you know go ahead and fight in Titan FC go ahead and fight in regional promotions you just can't fight in the UFC one Bellator the bigger the bigger guys and that's hard because again the fighters are then left with an argument of, well, they are letting me fight in other promotions, just not the ones I want to. And that's much harder to argue in court uh, in terms of saying, you know, we are under contract and then you're not allowing me to fight. It's like, no, you're totally allowed to fight, just not against these three promotions, which they view as direct competitors and which coincidentally going to pay the most money. And that's really the... The crux of it right is it's hard to argue that this is some kind of breach of contract or some kind of you know unfair practice when really it's about how much the promotions will pay you know lance palmer can say no i'll find titan fc you're just gonna pay me 50 grand or 100 grand and titan fc is gonna say nah we're good <laughs> And that's really a negotiation between Titan FC and Lance Palmer, right? It's not something that Titan FC can't afford to pay that price. So I, I don't think 
that the PFL lawsuit is going anywhere. I think it's pretty much dead. I'll keep an eye on it. If I hear anything, I'm sure you, you'll hear about it from me because um, I am curious to see if anything ever does come of this. And I'm, I'm watching a lot of different sources so that if any hint of it uh, happening, I, I definitely want to cover it and dive deeper into it. But I think at this point, you could probably safely say that for now, the PFL lawsuit is dead and, and the PFL won because not only did they, you know, get some great signings and really get media attention and fan attention away from, you know, this unfair practice lawsuit allegation from fighters, but the fighters really haven't, you know, done anything that's really got any bite to it. It's been a lot of bark, not a lot of bite. And that probably means they're in a good place contractually, the PFL. Is. So I, I think they, they, they won this one. We'll, we'll see, but I think that's probably it, and, and they come away with a win here. On to the UFC lawsuit. This is interesting, to say the least. Um, December 10th, that is a, a date you want to mark down your calendar. So one week from now, actually. The judge in the UFC antitrust lawsuit is set to hold a meeting where he's going to discuss whether or not that lawsuit is going to be granted class certification or not. Pretty much every indication here, including the press conference he had where he he didn't certify the class, but he almost outright said he was going to. He was asking if COVID had changed anything, if anything happened there, and everyone's like, no. Um, very interesting hearing that was held then. Um, but... Moving forward, every indication is that this is going to be granted class certification. And if that happens, that's a big win for the plaintiffs. It's not, oh man, slam dunk. Now the UFC has to pay the fighters a bunch of money and do all this. No, not even remotely close to that. There are still, you know, it, we, this has been going on for years. This is unfortunately just step, I don't know, five of 2000 at this point in terms of, you know, there's still so much left to go here. You still have to go to trial. You still have to, you know, prove that even for granted class certification, you still have to pr prove the UFC's monopsony power hurt the fighters and that, you know, the data that the plaintiffs are using holds up uh, against other UFC expert witnesses as well as through the trial and the appeals court, all of that. This is just for class certification. This is not saying the UFC ha has is at fault, used their monopsony power for unfair labor practices, violated the Sherman Act. That's not what they're saying here. That all still has to go to trial to be decided. This is just allowing the fighters to, you know, sue as one giant group so they can get those real legitimate damages if they win. Uh, that makes a huge difference rather than each fighter suing individually. Because the judge pretty much already said if he didn't grant class certification, you know, this lawsuit's dead. Because trying to figure out exactly how much the UFC owes Kung Lee um, is, is going to be way too hard. Trying to figure out how much they owe the fighters in general, how much they paid fighters compared to their revenues, using monopsony powers, unfair labor practices, how much the the group of fighters as a whole is, old, is owed, that's possible. Trying to find out how much each individual fighter is owed based on their tenure, how many times they fought, contracts, blah, 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 it's not feasible. So it looks like the lawsuit is going to make it to this next stage. I would be shocked if it's not granted class certification. Um, I, I'd be willing to bet a lot of money right now uh, that it's going to be granted class certification unless the judge is really just kind of trolling everybody and just saying, yeah, like this is going to happen. And then by the way, no, it's not. Um, that would be a whole nother thing. That'd be something else to, to discuss entirely. But you almost certainly are going to see the headlines December 10th that the UFC's antitrust lawsuit is granted class certification. They're going to move forward to go to possibly go to trial. Because remember, the other thing is, 
They could get class certification. They could be looking to go into trial and maybe the UFC tries to cut a deal. The ramifications of if, if this goes to trial and the remedies that could be given to the fighters are huge. It, I mean, you're looking at a possibility of, let's say something that's been thrown out there as a remedy. Let's say that, you know, fighters are only allowed to be signed to a one or two year contract max. That's it. No championship clauses of, hey, you're holding the belt. You got to keep getting extended. That changes everything. Because that means, hey, you know what? I'm Israel Adesanya. I'm a UFC superstar. I'm, I'm making money, doing all these things. They're, they're companies trying to push me as this next big thing. My contract is up. Bellator comes by and says, you know what? We're Viacom now. We've merged again. We've got crazy money. How about you come over here instead? UFC is like, we don't want to pay you as much as they're offering. That means Adesanya could leave. That's the type of, of power you're talking about here, is giving the fighters so much more negotiation power than they have right now. Because that means that they could be champion and then they could leave at any point to go to a Bellator, go to a PFL, go to one championship, wherever they want to go, if there's set contract links. And that changes the game. Right. It's not quite the boxing world of like now we got, you know, everybody we got 10 different belts, all this whole thing. It's not that, but it's definitely much more along the lines of fighters having a real, real negotiation chip, especially if they're bringing in pay-per-views and, and there's somebody the UFC wants to promote. Now you're talking about going back to the table and saying, no, you are going to pay me this much because otherwise I'm going to walk away because champions can't do that right now. They can, you know, push for different marketing deals. They can say, hey, I should get more money on my next contract, but they're, they're locked in and they can't go to a different promotion and fight somewhere else. That would, that would be a game changer. Much more so than, in, in many ways, much more so than, oh, the UFC owes this large sum of money. That would be massive too, especially with the amount of debt they've accrued, endeavors, you know, draining them because they're in trouble, especially through the pandemic, that could cause a financial collapse, which would be insane if it was a high enough uh, price tag here, right? But, you know, let's say fighters get awarded 50 million. That's a lot of money and it would hurt the UFC, but it doesn't really remedy things going forward. And it's something the UFC could absorb. It would be a setback. There would be changes. I'm sure there'd be cuts. There'd be a whole bunch of different stuff. But I mean, it, it's not a game changer. If it's one billion, two billion dollars, well, then you know, then you're in a whole different world. Or even several hundred million dollars. Then then you're talking about real financial uh, stress on an already financially distressed company that's owned by an even more financially distressed company. That's a massive game changer um you know that could cause utter collapse of the promotion which would be insane but what if anything happens is still way down the line you know whether it's through negotiations and they settle out of court whether it's through a long and lengthy trial where they're talking about all this stuff um nothing is is anywhere near set. So I just want you guys to remember that when you hear about the class certification that's happening next week, that will inevitably happen next week, don't take that as, oh my gosh, like fighters are now gonna get paid. Now, you know, this changes everything. It doesn't, not yet. It's a big win and a big step forward to the landscape changing um, and, and the UFC losing power and all of that. that it, it is a step towards that but it's not anything concrete that actually changes things yet. It allows the lawsuit to go forward and really be challenged in court and at trial for damages. It, it keeps it alive, but it doesn't mean that this is going to change the world, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, we've still got years uh, before we, we get any inkling of whether or not this lawsuit really uh, accomplished what it set out to achieve. So I, I want to thank you for listening and watching. 
Really appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, again, hit that like and subscribe button. If you're on Anchor, I appreciate it. Um, you know, feel free to hit me up again with comments, uh, questions on Twitter, YouTube, anything like that. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure trying to get some more guests lined up. Uh, it's, you know, end of the year type of stuff. Everybody's got holiday plans a little bit harder to do, but I'm definitely going to be cranking out more episodes like this. Uh, any and all feedback is appreciated. Always love it. Appreciate it. You guys uh, get that money and have a great Thursday. Stay warm. Mm -hmm.